something that we cannot see, but we are believing that He's already made a way. We have to believe. The scripture clearly says it's just your faith that is going to move the mountain. Sometimes we plan in grandeur and we know every single bit of the blueprint. But let me tell you, he has the best one in store for us. It is highly impossible. I firmly believe it that if he has created you and me for a purpose, there is a beautiful blueprint that he has in store and nothing ever can beat it. It will come to purpose. But it's up to you and me to believe and give ourselves to him and say, God, I want to stand in your will. I want to see what you can do with me, in me, through me, about me. In respect of everything that is around me, that is maybe a closed door or a closed window or a partial door, however you want to see it this morning. If you're believing that he's working behind the scenes and you know it for sure, you just have to lift your hand and say, Lord, thank you for making a way. When my eyes cannot comprehend to see, we want to praise you. Amen. Uh, Calvin, can you sing that song, please? Yeah. And I want everybody to sing it with conviction. You're not singing to me, to others, but to Jesus and say, God, I thank you. I thank you. I believe you're working behind the scenes to give me the best. I cannot see. Help me not to go tired and weary. Help me to hold on to the promises that I have received. Help me to do the part that I have to do and obey to receive that promise. But till that end, I want to believe God can make. Stop working, never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you working. Let's put our hands together and praise our God this morning. He truly is a way maker. And he is a miracle worker. As we, as we close our eyes and we offer ourselves to him. 
would you pray for yourself and ask, and ask him, God, would you speak to me today? For he's a God who loves to speak to us. And every hungry heart would be answered this morning. As we stand here in your presence, God, and what a joy it is to worship you. Who are we, God, that you are mindful of us? That you allow us to walk into your presence just as we are. We can come into your presence just as we are, God, with all these struggles that we go through. Even sin. Because of Christ, we stand here with confidence that when we come to you with a humble heart, we will receive your forgiveness. We will receive your grace. And so this morning we offer ourselves to you. All that we are. And you speak to us, God. Give us a heart to believe. Bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. This month is a very special month, right? Uh, September is always special to me. And, um, you know, it kind of always reminds me of wh how good God is. And um, 17 years have been a wonderful journey of watching God at work in, in my life, in our lives. Um, and many of you, may, uh, well, a lot of you have been on this journey with us for a long time. Uh, we have seen how good God is. So I was, uh, uh, while I was praying for this season and asking God to speak to me about what He is doing in my life and uh, in the life of our church, God spoke to me these words and He reminded me, the Spirit of God reminded me of these words that He spoke through Isaiah to His people. And um, in fact, uh, I was listening to a song, and that's a song we have, uh, we have sung today um, in the, right in the beginning, in the middle of the worship. We sang a song called New Thing is Coming. Um, and as I was listening to that song, the Holy Spirit reminded me of these verses from um, the book of Isaiah. Uh, I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 43. Um, I'm going to read from verses 18 and 19. And I kind of set, I'll set the context for you and what I believe um, the whole, you know, I have the Holy Spirit imprinted upon my heart. Chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. I'm, I'm reading from New Living Translation. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm about to do, what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, in fact, I've already began. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. And I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. The book of Isaiah, as um, Isaiah wrote, well, the, the word of God that he spoke to the people of Judah, as you read the book of Isaiah, you would see it naturally falls into three sections. Isaiah has gone through multiple leaders, under, under multiple leaders he has been the priest and the prophet in Judah speaking the word of God to his people. Uh, the first 39 chapters fall into one category, and 40, chapter 40 to 48, uh, right in the middle of it we are right now, with the, the verses that we have read are in the middle of that particular context. And then from 49 to 66 is the last section of Isaiah. You would see these three different sections, and you would see the progression in the prophetic word that came out of Isaiah's mouth as God spoke to his people. The first 39 chapters talk to the people of Judah and Jews and talking to them about why they're going to be in the predicament they're going to be in. The kind of judgment that God is going to bring upon them. Uh, why God holds them responsible 
for the predicament that they would be finding themselves in. So it's a, it's a kind of judgment pronunciation from God over the people of um, Israel, you know, Judah, Jews. And then um, when you read those 39 chapters, your, your heart may be filled with fear. Um, as you imagine the kind of future that you're going to experience because of the mess, up, mess that you did, um, you, 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 you may be afraid. You may be afraid the terrible things are going to come in my life. Terri I will find myself in ter terrible circumstances. God knows the kind of fear people may be experiencing at that time. And that's why he changes his tone from chapter 40. And begins to address them individually. If you read chapter 40 to chapter 48, God speaks very specifically to the people of Judah. Uh, he uses the word Jacob. Constantly reminding them, I know you by your name. It is in fact I who created you. So that people would understand that he is paying attention to them and there is hope because he pays attention to them. So 40 to 48 is a very personal word of God to his people. And then as you go to the next section, you would see then uh, he talks about how the deliverance would come and how the future would look like even after they, this generation is passed away and how uh, the Messiah would come in and how he would bring deliverance and all that. So if you read this, uh, this, this these two verses in isolation, you would obviously uh, mess it up. You would kind of misunderstand what he's saying. And there is a, he, our tendency is always to read into the scripture what we want. And that's why I kind of set you the context so that you would understand uh, these two verses are in the middle of a, a particular com word of comfort that God is bringing to his people. People who are suffering, people who are about to suffer, people who find themselves in difficult circumstances, people who find, are going to find themselves facing the real big giants. God is speaking to them and he's saying, as you find yourself among that, don't be afraid. For I am doing a new thing. A new thing is coming. He promises multiple things uh, in, this, in these eight chapters, nine chapters. Things uh, that he says about how he's going to bring a revival back into that nation, the people, that people group. You see, uh, the reason he used that is because uh, Isaiah has actually watched how this nation would experience great revival, spiritual revival, and then go straight into rebellion. I mean like a real rebellion against God. Then come back again in revival. You know, come back in their faith again after you know, they experience some kind of punishment from God. They would uh, you know, revive, revive their spirits in God and experience a spiritual revival. Then go back straight into uh, a rebellion. He, he's seen that cycle happening in that nation. And God is speaking through Isaiah and he's saying, listen... I know you are a rebellious person. I know you are somebody who refuses to listen to me. And yet, I'm not going to leave you like that. I'm going to revive you, bring, you, bring revival in, in, in this nation. Sometimes I feel our Christian walk is also similar to, 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 uh, to that. There are times that we are high in our spiritual life, high in our faith. We, we kind of want to uh, you know, feel like we are the world conquerors. And, then on the, uh, and sometimes we are right at the opposite end of the spectrum. Completely un unbelief engulfs us, fear engulfs us. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, because of the circumstances, or because of the kind of people we face, because of unanswered prayers, we kind of push ourselves to the other end and... Uh, you know, find ourselves in a very a desperate um, uh, situation. So God promises that I will bring revival. He promises salvation to them. That I would redeem you from the place that you're going to be in. You know, from verses, uh, chapter 1 to chapter 39, he painted a picture of the kind of future that they're going to have, uh, how difficult life is going to look like, under the uh, you know, Babylonian rule, in the ba Babylonian captivity, how difficult life would look like. And that can cause fear. That can make 
anyone who hears that feel like there is no hope, there is no future for me. I don't think I can ever get healed. I don't think I can ever get out of this, uh, uh, this, 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 this slavery to this particular habit. I don't know if, if I can ever find myself a free man, a free woman. And God speaks to them and he says, listen, I'll redeem you. I'll save you from there. I'd grant you freedom. Uh, one of the reasons why God used the word freedom with them is um, when um, Nebuchadnezzar would uh, ultimately capture them and take them into captivity, he'd bring them to uh, this place called Rama and then um, divide them, divide the families um, and send them to different corners of his empire so that there would never be a chance of these families coming together and maybe come up with a rebellion against him. That was his strategy in order to make sure that he rules well. And so God, God already talked to them about that and how the families are going to be divided. And yet he says, don't, give, don't, don't, do it. don't worry. I will ask the south to give up. I will ask the east to give up. Your children, your daughters, they will come back to this place. He would talk about how this, all these things would happen in the middle of severe persecution, in the middle of severe drought, how he's going to provide for them. A provision is coming. In the middle of all that, how he would heal people and restore their joy. So if you read 40 to 48, you would see... Um, the promise of God is of a revival, of salvation, of freedom, of provision, of healing, of joy. And reminding them, don't, 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 don't give up, it's coming. It's on the way. So I, as, I, as, as I sat down and began to read through these nine chapters, and I started underlining what God is speaking to his people, and I felt God was speaking the same thing to me and to all of us this year as a church, there are five statements of God to his people that he keeps repeating all through these nine verses. And all five of them point to something. And that's why you see five symbols throughout this month. I don't know if anybody wondered, why are they there? And each of them means something. And I wanted to talk about all those five today. The first thing that God speaks to them is that do you not perceive it? Do you not understand this? That's a question he asked, right? For I'm about to do something new. See, I've already began. Do you not see it? There are many times, another translation, it says, do you not perceive it? Do you not understand it? It is the same thing that God continues to speak all through those nine chapters. Verses 10, look at verses 10 of the same chapter, 43. But you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me and believe me, believe in me, and understand that I am alone God. I alone am God. They, a lot of us struggle in our faith journey because of lack of understanding. We see the things that, are, that happen in our lives. We see the thing that we are facing ahead of us. We see dark clouds and wonder, is there any future? Last week, um, our guest speaker spoke about how dark clouds does not mean sun is not shining. Just because you see dark clouds, it doesn't mean sun is not shining. Sun is about that. Just because your life seems like surrounded by dark clouds does not mean God is not present. God is always there. It, that, that, that's not going to change. He's always going to be there. Sun is always going to be there. Sun is always going to shine. It's just that the dark clouds are there. While he, while he was reminding us of that fact, I started writing, writing down that thought. It's a wonderful thought to think. I, I never thought it that way. And I'm suddenly reminded of... Um, um, a place where Elijah found himself in. And I wrote down that on my notes. 
while dark clouds does not mean sun is not shining dark clouds also means god is coming something new is coming on that day on the top of that mount mount moriah while uh, um I, uh, you know elijah killed all these ball prophets and as he was uh, um you know three years drought by then it's already three years drought in israel and um uh, ahab was standing there now isaiah uh, uh, elijah pronounces that god is going to send the rain there are no clouds there it's a clear sky he buckles down on his uh, on his knees puts his face between his knees and begins to pray and looks up asks his servant to go and see if there is a cloud coming there's no cloud first time then the second time he asks do you see a cloud no i don't see a cloud the third time he asks him do you see a cloud yes i see one one little piece somewhere in the corn in the horizon and then bible talks describes in chapter chapter 18 of 1 kings ends uh, with this miraculous thing that's happening at that point of time uh, just as they were looking those that little cloud somewhere in the horizon begins to engulf the sky this clear sky and darkens the whole place and heavy storm with rain and wind begins to descend upon that land drenching that land with water sometimes dark clouds also means a new thing is coming maybe that's what god was trying to remind them just because you see dark clouds does not mean i am not doing anything it in fact means something new is coming into your life a new season is being ushered into your life the problem with us is we see only dark clouds we don't see what it is going to bring and that's why you need a new a new understanding new perception a new vision the way you see must be changed as you continue following elijah after chapter 18 chapter 18 is like the pinnacle of his ministry elijah's ministry elijah gets introduced in chapter 17 of 1 kings by the end of chapter 18 he is like like the top guy in that nation like even the king is afraid of him to talk back to him because everything elijah says is coming true whatever elijah is doing god is working on his behalf giving him success and fruit the kind of miracles that god performed on behalf of elijah would have caused fear in everybody's heart who watched his life so he's like the 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 guy who's on the top of his ministry uh his spiritual life spiritual walk faith all that and then in chapter 19 you see a completely different elijah you see this guy who when he heard what elizabel Ez- Ez- had jezebel had told him sent him jezebel actually heard about from ahab's mouth uh, about how elijah treated all the baals prophets and how he killed them the kind of havoc he created on that on, on that mount mount carmel sorry mount carmel um um jezebel was in a furious and she sent a message messenger to him saying uh, listen by tomorrow I'll, i'll 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 kill you that's what she said i'll kill you tomorrow dorikte jal nak nu kind of thing yes if i can get you i'm going to kill you the moment he heard that this man began to fear so much for his life he ran away from that place from his ministry from the place where god exalted him he began to run away from that place so much so that he went so far away 40 days right he journeyed more than 40 days and into the desert and uh, hid himself in a cave you never associate elijah with fear but yet circumstances in our lives can sometimes put so much fear in us even when we have the spiritual life like elijah we can still be filled with fear and run away from the purpose of god for our lives 
hiding in that cave god calls him out and asks him elijah why are you here and elijah says something like what we usually say in our own prayers right saying god i'm the only guy who is good christian everybody else in our church is a hypocrite i don't know why they come on a sunday morning to the church i am the only guy who's trying to be the guy who follows the word and i'm regular tight giver and all that and now they are trying to throw me out of the church too i'm just contemplating it so that's his prayer he's saying listen god i'm really tired of people um in fact i want to die i'm too tired enough is enough that's what he said enough is enough i'd like to die too tired of everything too tired trying to be a good guy trying to be the guy who follows the word um i can't do this god doesn't condemn him doesn't do anything what he what god did next is something that we all need to understand pay pay attention to god simply displayed who he is to him in the fire and the earthquake in the wind that blew by bible says god was not in that and yet it is the display of his power then finally god speaks to him in still small voice what he spoke to him at that point of time we don't see what he gave instruction we see later but at that point of time he just simply spoke to him and i began to look at that and i, I realized this while the power of god when we believe in him is at work in our lives and through us elijah has seen the power of god at display through his life right when he prayed rain stopped when he prayed storms came when he prayed uh, a fire came from heaven he saw all the power display of god through his life and how god acted on his behalf you have seen all that miracles maybe his perception maybe i'm just i could be wrong here maybe elijah's perception of god is god is a miracle miracle working god he would he, which is true of course is a powerful god is a mighty god what i think elijah missed out and i think what god is trying to show elijah is listen as much as i'm a powerful god i'm a personal god i pay attention to your life i know what you're thinking i know how you're feeling i need you to see that in that display of his power and then in the still small voice of god speaking to elijah god revealed himself as a personal god elijah i love for you to do great miracles for me on behalf of me but i want you to know i'm more interested in your life see the perception he changed the way elijah looked at himself what god was trying to do with jews while he is speaking through isaiah is the same thing while you may see the circumstances that can become really terrible and you may perceive them as punishments i want you to know that's not a punishment i'm in fact making a new way for you god changed elijah's perception god is interested in changing the way you think in isaiah chapter 26 verses 3 um god speaks to his people of course through isaiah to his people and look at what he says you you will keep in perfect peace how will you keep in perfect peace it's the same thing he's talking to the people you will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in you and all those whose thoughts are fixed on you what he's saying is if you can keep your thoughts on god not on your problem not on the things that are happening around you then the way you see things will change you see it's it's our thoughts that decide how we see things and understand them perceive them so what 
God was interested, is interested today in your life and my life is to, to change that place, the, the way that we think. How we think would decide a lot of things in our lives. If Elijah's thoughts that are changed now had helped him to grow into a new season of leadership, after that, Elijah has become a really bold guy. The same, pe- same person from whom he's running away, two chapters later, you would see him standing in front of the same lady and telling her, ah, you're going to die like a dog. I mean, without fear, an ounce of fear at all. He tells Jezebel, Jezebel, you and all your family, you will die like a dog. Dogs will lick your blood that's on the ground. Where did that, 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 that courage came? Same guy who was so depressed in his life, afraid of that woman so much, who prayed, God, please kill me. Where did that courage came? Because God changed the way he thought, he thinks. He sees and understands things. That's how effective when God begins to work in our lives and at the thought level, our life would be changed completely. If you don't let that happen, we'd be like the people in uh, Genesis chapter 6. Have you ever thought about why God really wanted to to wipe away the mankind from the face of this earth? Genesis chapter gives us a hint into that, saying that not only the actions of human beings were evil, but even the inclination of their thoughts was evil. Even at the thought level they were sinning, meaning even dreaming about sinning. Their imagination. No wonder Paul would have. Uh, no wonder Paul would have understood this so well. He, he he told us in Philippians, saying, "Think about these things," and he lists out things that we need. To, chapter four, he lists out things that we need to think about so that our thought process can change into into the kind of uh, uh, into the way that the, the God, our God, uh, looks at things uh, and thinks. Now God speaks to the same people and says, don't don't look at the dark clouds and worry that there are dark clouds. Dark clouds means a new thing is coming. Uh, But You see, when we begin to perceive well, then faith is born in us. We can begin to believe. Isn't that what he said in verses, verses 10? But you are my witnesses, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me and believe in me. How would you believe in me when you understand who I am? Our struggle generally with regards to our faith is, as I told you, is based on the circumstances that we face. And our understanding of who our God is. I watched the journey, as you watch the journey of Abraham, you'd see how God transformed his life and his faith. Chapter 12 begins with God speaking to Abraham and saying, listen, I'd like you to come out, leave your people, leave your land, come out from there and go to a place that I will show you. And there I will make you a great nation. It's a wonderful promise. You will be a blessing to all the nations. Anyone who blesses you would be blessed. Anyone who curses you would be cursed. You'd be great. Anyone who hears such kind of promise would do what Abraham did. Of course, when you receive a promise like that directly from God, you would be willing to do anything for him. Abraham did. As he journeyed from there, From chapter 12 to chapter 22, I think it's a very crucial period in Abraham's life, 25 years of his life. In that journey, you would see Abraham's faith growing and falling down. Going up, coming down. Going up and coming down. Till chapter 22, where his faith became steady. 
This is the journey that helped them to clearly understand what God is doing. In this journey, he made, a, made many bad decisions, hasty decisions, decisions that were made because of the circumstances. And all through that journey, God did not give him up, uh, give up on him. You would see there are at least three personal conversations with Abraham through that journey, reiterating his promise to him, reiterating what he wants to do. I wondered why Abraham struggled, and I kind of realized that's how we also all struggle. For in Abraham's mind, when God says, I will make you a great nation, he's thinking, I'll have many children. Isn't that how you think? I love many children. First of all, I don't have children. When God says, You'll, I'll make you a great nation, He's going to give me a lot of children. Human mind, when you think of blessing, is always numbers. If I go to a pastor's fellowship and I meet a new pastor, I'm just using my example, huh? and say, hi, hi, I'm Chaitanya. Okay, where do you, what do you do? I'm a pastor. Well, I pastor a church in high tech city. Uh, the inevitable question after that. This is inevitable question. How many people come to your church? Now, based on the number that I give, he's going to assess my life and my success. My whatever. <laughs> my worth. Isn't, we are number people. We always want numbers. Based on the size, the number, the quantity... Uh, we decide uh, the worth, the faith, and everything, character. Um, I'm, I'm sure Abraham struggled with his journey because he thought, I'll have a lot of children. So he's waiting for that one children, one child, who would be the guy who is going to become the source of many nations, a big nation, great nation. So he would run to Egypt in order to save his family, in the middle of a drought, leaving the promised land that God took him there, uh, the, the place that God took him. And God brought him back again. He would then listen to his wife, or uh, the circumstance, not just his wife, but the circumstance itself is like that. I don't want to right now put Sarah in corner. So <laughs> I'm just saying, I think both of them are guilty of the, of the thing that they've done at that point of time. They both decided, uh, I think it's better maybe God means this. And then went for the, uh, um, you know, the other hasty step that they took with Aigar, uh, ended up with uh, Ishmael in their hand, who was not the promised child. All through this, God kept speaking to him. Kept reiterating the promise. Even after Ishmael is born, God spoke to him and told him, listen, I'm going to do this for you. Finally, Abraham, by the time you come to chapter 20, is telling God, listen, I'm, I'm too old. Maybe 75 was a good, good age. Maybe 80 was a better age, but um, I'm 99 now. I, I've, I've, I've gone past. She's gone past the childbearing years. I don't think she's going to have a child. It's not possible. He's talking to God, who's telling him, I'm going to give you a child. We all do that. It's just that we never confess that. We all do that with God. When God is directly talking to you and saying, listen, I'm going to do this for you. You're like, no, you know, you know God, I think you got it wrong. It's not possible right now. Look at the journey. By the time you come to chapter 22, he has learned how God functions. So when God asked him, after giving the child, after Isaac grew, grew up for a, for a bit, God says, I'd like for you to give me Isaac as a sacrifice. Chapter 22 starts off by saying, God wanted to test Abraham. What was God testing him for? We always think, and it may be right, we always think God was testing the obedience of Abraham, but I think God was testing Abraham's perception of God. I'm, I think I'm a little bit right on that. Because Hebrews, the author of Hebrews tells us that. 
So God told him, can you give him as a sacrifice to me? And Ab Abraham decides he'll do that. He take him, ready to sacrifice. And God stops him and says, now I know you fear me. Now I know you fear me. And then it's, it's almost as if now I'm making a covenant with you, Abraham. In verses, uh, chapter 22, towards the last part of chapter 22, the angel of the Lord spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, now I will certainly do what I promised to you. You're ready now to receive the promise that I gave you. You're ready. I will certainly do that. The author of Hebrews tells us, both talking about both Abraham and Sarah's faith, he tells us that Abraham believed by faith that God is able to raise up the dead son, his son. Because he gave him this child beyond the childbearing days, right? When his body was dead, as good as dead, God gave him a child. And so Abraham believed and was ready to sacrifice his son because Abraham believed that if God gave me a dead person, a child in this age, God is able to rise up my dead child also. Now you see what, uh, what God was trying to test. He was trying to test Abraham's understanding of who he is. The more you understand God, the more faith it will generate in you. A fresh faith. Fresh faith. Every time, this journey of Abraham, every time Abraham fell and struggled with his faith, God gave him a fresh start by renewing his faith. By giving him a new insight about who he is. Reiterating his promise to him. And each time he got a start, this fresh faith, his level of understanding who is God is as grown. Stop looking at the material blessing. Stop looking at the financial blessing. Although they are part of his blessing, he began to realize none of this matters. My promises don't matter as long as I keep my eyes on the promise giver. As long as my thoughts are on the promise giver. That's why the author of Hebrews says, even though many of them did not see their promises to come to fulfillment in their lifetime, they believed in the one who gave. And so they lived their life based on that faith. Are you struggling with faith? Dark clouds are making you feel like, I don't know if this is possible. Dark clouds means a new thing is coming. As God opens your, your, your mind and begins to reveal himself, as you begin to understand who he is, faith is born. There's another thing that God kept repeating all through those chapter 40 to 48. The third word, understanding the first one. The second one is faith. The third, uh, you can believe. The third one is, this is me who is talking to you. I mean, people already know God is speaking to them. But he almost, on purpose, it looks like a, as if on purpose, he keeps reminding them. As if uh, he knows that they will forget to remind them, listen, this is not Isaiah speaking, it's me who's speaking to you. It's me who's speaking to you. It's me who's speaking to you. So that it is me who's talking to you. I wondered why God would repeat himself so many times saying, this is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. It dawned on to me that we tend to forget a lot. 72 hours from now, the well, majority of you will forget what I just preached. It's a truth I came to adjust my life and live with. Okay. Years of pastoring, I realized, okay, if I repeat the same message next Sunday, you'd probably come and say, wow, what a message. <laughs> so 
Um, capstone is a little different, I know. But we tend to forget because we half listen. We listen to things that we want to listen to. No wonder Jesus would always say, let those who have ears hear. Didn't they hear just now? But he would keep repeating that. Telling them, listen, just because you have ears does not mean you are actually listening to me. I know. Uh, 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 it's like Jesus saying, I know you. You are not hearing me completely. So better hear it properly. You see, it is by listening to the word of God that faith is born in us. Paul says that. How do people believe? By hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. And so God is trying to remind everything that is coming out of this pulpit, everything that is using the people around you, things around you and trying to speak to you. He's saying, I'm talking to you. Just listen. Pay attention. Sometimes it is because we don't pay attention to how God speaks to us. We always assume God should speak to us like this, you know. Use a prophet, use a pro pastor to speak that, that would be, of course, God is going to use people like me. But God also uses things around us, testimonies of people around us in order to speak into our lives. The one place Jesus was completely caught off God, not that he's caught, really caught off God, but, you know, it kind of, the, the, the gospel writer kind of paints it like that, that Jesus was completely, wow, I didn't think about this kind of thing, was the conversation that he had with Centurion. A centurion walked up to Jesus one day in Capernaum and said, Jesus, um, my servant is unwell. I'd like you to heal him because I know what you have done. The centurion probably heard about what Jesus had done in Cana. While Jesus was in Cana, he did two miracles, right? One was uh, turning water into wine and then uh, the other was the healing of a noble man. who came to him and asked him, my son is unwell, would you come and heal him? And Jesus would not budge from the place that he was in and he says, you go, he's got, he, he'll be healed. And that man, when he believed and was walking away on his journey on the way back home, heard the news, another servant who brought the news saying, your son is well. What was the time that happened? And obviously... He knew it was uh, when exactly when Jesus said, maybe the, the news, the testimony about, uh, uh, about how God healed this person had spread so much, it reached to, uh, to the ears of the centurion. So he comes to him and he says, listen, my, my, my servant is unwell, would you, would, you, would you heal him? First of all, Jesus was surprised that a centurion came to him. It's not Jew, but a Roman who came to him, or whatever he was who came to him, he's definitely not a, not, not a Jew, he's, he's a Gentile who came to him, so he says, well, I, I'd like to make use of this opportunity. He says, let's go. What he said at that moment, of course, caught Jesus completely off guard. Jesus, he looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, I understand how authority works. Look at this guy's understanding. Huh? I understand how authority works. I am a man of authority. When I ask somebody to come, they come. When I ask somebody to go, they go. So I know how authority works. And I know you are a man of authority. So if you stand here, you just have to stand here and say, my servant is healed and he would be healed. That, that's why I said Jesus is completely caught off guard. And he says, whoa, I've never seen anybody with such kind of faith in all of Israel. Never seen anybody like this. How did the centurion believe? Because he, he, he heard about what God can do, what Christ, Christ can do and what Christ did and believed it. God speaks to us from all, uh, using everything that is around us, all circumstances, through the testimonies of people and through the word of God being preached and proclaimed from the pulpit. You just have to pay attention. 
I am the one who's speaking. That, that's why he probably is trying to remind them, listen, new thing is coming, but you've got to pay attention to what I'm speaking. But the thing is this, we have, we generally struggle with unbelief because we don't pay attention. Be the reason we don't pay attention is because of the sin that is present within us. Unbelief is a sin, by the way. God's, I, actually, I think that we should go to those verses and look at this. Look at what God speaks to him. Speaks to the people of uh, Ju uh, to Judah, Jews. And he's saying, uh, as we continue those verses, verse 20, chapter 43, verses 20, the wild animals in the field will thank me, the jackals and the owls too, for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland, so my chosen people can be refreshed. I've made Israel for myself. And they will someday honor me before the whole world. But dear family of Jacob, he's talking to you and me, huh, by the way. You refuse to ask me for help. You actually stopped asking me for help. You used to ask me for help. Now you refuse to stop asking me for help. You refuse to ask me for healing. You refuse to ask me for that opportunity that you always prayed for and then you just stopped. Why? Why did you stop? Because you've grown tired of me. You've grown tired of me. I love the Telugu translation better than English, actually. You just, you just, you, you're so frustrated, you stopped praying. Could that be one of the reasons why we are not able to listen to the voice of God? that we actually stopped talking to him because of unanswered prayers before? And the repercussion of that is the next verse. Look at what happens when we stop talking to him. You have not brought me sheep or goats for, or for burnt offerings. You have not honored me with sacrifices. Though I have not burdened and wearied you, with requests of grain offerings and frankincense. You have, brought, you have not brought me fragrant calamus and pleased me with the fat from sacrifices. Instead, you have burdened me with your sin and wearied me with your faults. When you stop talking to God, you stop listening to Him. Obviously, you can't listen to Him. And because in your frustration, you are angry with God and bitter with God, you stop doing what you're supposed to do. Now, God doesn't need goats and sheep. He's not going to make biryani out of that. He doesn't need all that for, from you. He just needs you to show that you will still continue to glorify Him through what you do for Him, even though you don't see an answer right now. You closed your fist to God almost in an act of rebellion because God, you closed your fist, I'm closing my fist. And God considers that as sin. I said, you, you're storing up your sin. But he doesn't stop there. The beauty of our God, and I, that's the point I want to reiterate today, is the next verse. You have done so much, but yes, I, I alone will blot out your sins. For my own sake, for my own sake, and we'll never think of them again. That's why he started off by saying, forget the past. He's saying, I know you, your past, you're still carrying it, the burden of that, you're still carrying all the mess that you did. I already forgot, so just leave it there and let, let's just, let's have a fresh start again. You see the grace of God at display here? You stop talking to me, you stop listening to me, you stop serving me, by that you are gathering sin against me. Technically I am supposed to punish you, but I choose to forgive you. For my own sake I choose to forgive you and give you another offer. 
as you go on reading towards the end of the chapter, he says, come, let's, let's reason it out. Sit down. Let's sit down and talk. Let's see where you are righteous and I'm not righteous. Prove your righteousness. He knew that none of us would ever be able to sit there and say, I'm righteous to him. The grace of God at display. What he's saying is, your heart is filled with sin, but I'm going to transform that, give you a new heart. A new heart would help you to start paying attention to my voice. And as you start paying my voice, uh, attention to my voice, you'd begin to understand who I am and thus have faith. It's not just this, at this place. He has done that all through the scripture. Take Samson's life as an example. A person who is anointed by God, have a call of God upon his life, has a purpose for which God called him for, messed up royally in his life. The journey of Samson, 20 years of his journey as a judge, never once did he do anything for the glory of God. He did great many things with the Lord's help. But never once did he do anything with a true heart. A servant heart. He's been successful in everything that he had done. In fact, I always find it very fascinating in the life of uh, Samson that every time Samson was about to do something, Bible says, the, the Spirit of God came upon him and Samson did whatever he did after that. Until he came to a place where he's caught by Philistines of his own doing, that is. God was not punishing him. He did it. Well, God allowed that punishment to come upon him. Now he sits there with eyes gouged out, treated like a buffalo in, in that Philistine's Dagon's temple. As he sits there, his mind opened up now. He began to understand who he was and what God did for him. And so he prays this prayer of repentance to God. At the fag end of his life, huh? remember this, at the fag end of his life, all his journey was alone, even though with the power of God, alone. Now he sits there in that prison, prays, God, listen, I'm, I'm messed up. And God gives him a fresh start. Again. I will say it's about how on that day as the Spirit of God came upon him again that what Samson did on that day as he brought the Dagon's temple down onto the Philistines who were sitting there and worshipping their own God as he brought that temple down. Bible says and what a closing for a, such a debaucherous life. Only God can do this. As he brought this temple down Bible says Samson killed more Philistines on that one single day than his entire life as a judge for 20 years. One day with the right heart, you would achieve more than all the things that you have achieved in all your life. That's the kind of heart that God wants to give us. A new heart. He did the same with Peter. If Samson is a guy who journeyed away from God alone. Peter is a guy who journeyed with God all his uh, faith life at least. From the time he came to know Jesus and chose to follow Jesus, the three and a half years that he was with Jesus, everywhere Jesus went he was, he was the closest member of Jesus' uh, inner circle, right? He was in the inner circle. Peter, James and John. What Peter, James and John saw, nobody else saw. Heard, nobody else heard. Experienced, nobody else experienced. These are the only three guys who could see uh, be at the top of the Mount Transfiguration, the, the event of Transfiguration, and saw Jesus in his full glory before Jesus actually died and rose from the dead. They saw who Jesus really was. Peter had such a great experience of journeying, a faith journey with Jesus, and yet... One moment destroyed everything. 
if it was one moment that changed Peter's, uh, Samson's life, it was that one moment of denial of who Jesus was that destroyed everything for Peter. But yet, even in this case, God doesn't give up on him. On that day when Jesus rose from the death, when this woman went to see Jesus and uh, embalm him on, on the Sunday morning, as they encountered the angel of the Lord, what was the angel of the Lord speaking to them and saying? He's not here. He's risen. Now go tell the disciples, especially Peter. That's the God we have. Fresh start again for Peter. Fresh start again for Samson. Fresh start again to you and to me. With a new heart. And then one last thing that he promises in those scriptures, uh, in those nine uh, chapters... Chapter 44. Let me jump to chapter 44. Let's, let's start reading from the beginning and I'll um, point that out to you. But now listen to me, Jacob, my servant. Israel, my chosen one. The Lord who made you and helps you says, do not be afraid. Chapter 40 starts off with the same statement, huh, by the way. Do not be afraid of Jacob, my servant, my dear Israel, my chosen one. Look at how many times he's reminding you and me who we are in him. I will pour out my spirit on your descendants. You will see God repeating this in all those nine chapters, at least four times. I will pour my spirit upon you, upon your children, upon your descendants. My spirit. I wondered why God kept talking about His Spirit. As you look at both Old Testaments and New Testaments and the work of the Holy Spirit, especially in the words of Jesus, you would realize why God kept speaking about the Spirit. Jesus talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, 15 and 16. If ever you wondered why God gave us the Holy Spirit, you should read those three chapters and listen to what Jesus is speaking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, just for the sake of our understanding, I'll restructure what Jesus said. Here is the first thing that Jesus talked about. The work of the Holy Spirit in this world is to convict the world of its sin. And the impending judgment because of the sin. But he doesn't stop there. He also convicts us of righteousness. So that we may be led to the truth. So when Holy Spirit works in your life, He first of all helps you to see who you really are. And if you continue to stay like that, what happens to you? But He doesn't leave us in that place. He wants to show us what is a better way. Because on our own, we can never see the truth. We are not people geared up for that life. You know, we are, we are not like that. We, the sin veils us from seeing the truth. So what Holy Spirit does is He convicts us of the truth. He leads us to the truth. Jesus talks about it in chapter 14. Leads us to the truth. Illuminates our mind to understand the truth. But He doesn't stop there. He says He reminds you of that truth. As I told you, we will forget. And so the reason the Holy Spirit is there is that not only He leads us to the truth, Helps us to understand the truth as he teaches us, but he reminds us every time we are struggling with our faith. And I realize that's probably why God kept telling them, I will pour my spirit upon you so that you will continue to be refreshed every time you are struggling in your faith, every time you are struggling to believe, he would work within you so that you can have a fresh start again. This is not an excuse for us to continue to live in sin. Neither this is an excuse for us to live in rebellion. The consequences of unbelief and the consequences of rebellion, he already talked about it. 
already before 39 chapters but he says just because the consequences look dire don't worry you still have hope you have hope in me and i'm here to give you another start a new heart new mind fresh faith new wine and now word isn't that what we sang just a couple of minutes ago now word it's not a word uh, that is not meaningful it's a word that is now for your now situation we call it rema word right logos and rema in hebrew it's a it's a word called dabar which means god is speaking i'm speaking now into your life i'm speaking now into your situation i'm speaking now it may have been written recorded long back but it speaks into your situation today into your family today into your spiritual condition today and because it comes so fresh now you will begin to see the new thing that i'm doing in your life and have new fresh faith so i pray that as we close this um i want to talk about caleb today but last week pastor already spoke so I, i'm not going to touch on that but you know when the spirit of god works in you you'll have a different spirit i love my servant caleb isn't that what we talked about last week i love my servant caleb because he has a different spirit and that's where god is going to take us a different people with different spirit unlike everybody else people with different spirit that we see things differently we believe differently we behave differently we live our lives differently may god help us to reach there this season would you like to close your eyes right now and as i'm going to invite our worship team i'm going to ask them to sing that song as a proclamation for us on behalf of all of us together we will sing this new heart new mind now a fresh faith new wine and now word that god um promised to us the season of our life take a moment to give thanks by, by you know by giving thanks to god for speaking to you and if you know god is speaking to you personally today ask him to give you faith if you're struggling with faith thank him for giving you a fresh start one more time ask him to transform your heart that is struggling to continue to be in faith new heart ask him to take control of your thoughts and put his word so that you can have new mind we all need it new mind new heart fresh faith now word and the spirit of god upon us i'm going to take a moment to pray with you right now and then we will join and sing this song as a proclamation thank you jesus Father we thank you that you're here today. We thank you for speaking to us, speaking to me God. And to Capstone. Sometimes we can be caught up so much with the promises. And that's probably why many of us struggle in our faith journey and in our perception of things and because we pay half attention to you we pick and choose what we want but today thank you for speaking to us and saying listen i'm going to change your mind if we are willing to let you as your word gets imprinted upon our minds and in our heart a new way of thinking and looking at things imagining things 
giving birth to a fresh faith reiterated by your word revealed by the spirit of god as you make a new heart for us transform our hearts thank you god for everyone who chooses to offer themselves to you i choose to offer myself to you today i pray that you change the way i think replace my thoughts with your word god i pray that you touch my ears open my ears always to pay attention to the voice of the spirit i pray that you i pray that you touch my eyes so that i may see what you see and what everybody sees but what you see that as you touch my heart my heart would be filled with faith faith in you not in the things but in you and that my mouth would begin to proclaim that faith in worship in praise in thanksgiving i see the cloud god i see the salvation i see the revival i see the provision i see the joy but most importantly i see jesus today dark clouds may be surrounding me but i know that god a new thing is coming thank you jesus spirit move among us freely and as we lift up your name and worship you may we see it may we perceive it may we believe it i got the new mind new heart fresh faith i got the new mind now got a new thing coming i got the new mind new heart fresh faith i got the new mind now got a new thing coming i got the new mind new heart fresh faith i got the new
church, for our lives, for my life. Thank you for the fresh start. Thank you for the fresh faith. Thank you for the spirit who enables us to believe. So may we, may we live our lives not by sight, but by your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you put your hands together and praise our God this morning? You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And I, I praise God for the opportunity that God continues to give us to receive his word. And when we are paying attention, he would always speak to us. One of the things that I, um, you know, enjoyed most is, uh, I enjoy still most is to learn from people. And I have two favorite teachers in Bible college. Uh, one of them uh, always, um, at the very pivotal point of my life, when I'm about to make really bad decisions, <laughs> would correct me and nudge me in the right direction. And I would have really messed up my Bible school studies if um, one of those teachers was not there. Another one, I have the privilege of having him today here with us, who taught me to think well. Um, he, he, he was my, uh, my teacher in Bible school, um, who taught us apologetics and, um, and you know, the correct way to think and defend, understand our faith and defend our faith. And uh, what a privilege it is to have you serve with us. Would you like to come on stage? Uh, Reverend B.C. Mother, would you, would you please come on stage? I told him, listen, if, if you had told me if you were coming, I would have loved for you to have speaking to us. But I still, I'm going to put you in corner and ask you to give us a greeting uh, uh, at church. And, you know, it's, it's such a joy to have you with us today, sir. Thank you, Pastor Chaitanya. Um, you know, uh, in Telugu, there is a 
word that says uh, there's a poem actually it says putro sahmu tandrik putrudu janinchina pudu kaadu gaani aa putrudu kanugoni janulu pugidina pudu ellali what it means is that it is not when the son is born but when actually people recognize that son and say you have a great son and uh, uh, for a teacher uh, there is no greater joy than to see a student who does expound the word of god so well uh, i was uh, telling uh, my daughter who was sitting right next to me and said i am so glad that uh, uh, i hear this message uh, it's very well thought through very well expounded and um, to see chaitanya um, growing in the lord and uh, pastoring uh, very growing church capstone aj church 17 years of faithful service to the lord and it is amazing it is just amazing and um, um, i think it's not very often uh, that you um you find get into a church where the word of god gets respected you know one thing that i can tell you this because i travel a lot and i speak in a lot of churches i've been part of the churches there's one tendency of uh, churches becoming into what we call the experience more yeah, you know what actually it feels good but you know what nothing replaces nothing should replace the word of god and i think when the church is founded and continues to grow and respect the word of god as a church that grows well and if uh, the church continues to rely only on pastor the church would not grow when the pa- church starts to grow through the word of god and when the pastor is actually administering and leading everybody towards the word of god then you are actually doing a great job and i think that is exactly what it is and um, and i'm so glad that i'm part of this uh, church service today and i'm just visiting and currently i work as the national director and ceo for world vision uh, and um, we work among the children we work among the most vulnerable children in india and uh, i have joined by my wife madhuri who's a mathematics professor and uh, thank you and um, my daughter who works here and um, she works for um, a company as marketing manager and she lives here so we just came to visit her and uh, we thought that you know where do we go today and i said because we stay very close by um, here um, and then he said okay let's go to capstone church and uh, let's uh, uh be part of uh, be ministered by uh, uh pastor chaitanya and i think uh absolutely pastor chaitanya has a very good message and personally i'm blessed personally i'm blessed uh the way that you have spoke and that god spoke to me and god bless you and god bless you i'm so glad would you like to pray for us uh, sure. and the church today our dear heavenly father we just thank you you do a new thing your mercies are new every morning you are not someone who gives to us something that is of old you always renew us father lord jesus this morning if there is anyone here sitting here thinking lord are you going to speak to me are you going to do a new thing in my life i'm struggling lord thank you lord for speaking to such individual today thank you lord for speaking to us every one of us doing a new thing i pray father lord jesus particularly for 17 years of your faithful service and your grace upon this church thank you jesus Thank you Lord for the Holy Spirit of God guiding us and making us to grow in you Lord. Thank you Lord for Pastor Chaitanya and his dear wife Janet. And I pray for the Lord as they serve you so faithfully in this church that Lord that the church would continue to grow from strength to strength. It's not about the numbers as pastor so rightly said 
it's about the depth in which we grow i pray father lord jesus that your anointing would continue to rest upon this church that you would start doing a new things in through this church you have strategically placed this church at a place of oh father lord where there's so much of a bustling so much of activity but yet lord jesus so devoid of experiences so much of devoid of meaning and you have placed this church as a capstone in this church Thank in this place i pray father lord jesus that we would continue to grow and make a difference in the communities that we live we praise you and we thank you we commit ourselves into your hand we pray this in jesus name amen amen amen, amen. god bless you sir thank you thank you so much thank you once again for oh, joining us today All right, we're going to close the service. Um, before we do that, let's take our offerings and our tithes. Get ready to worship God through our giving. And as you prepare yourselves, we're going to do a new thing again. All right, you have some other song. Do the new thing again. Enjoy the song as you give to the Lord.
Way. 